So good morning, good morning, and welcome to today's event. I'm uh, Kevin Marbury, I'm the Vice President for Student Life, and I have the great honor to present to some and introduce to others an icon, uh, Jackie Jonah Kersey. Uh, she was dubbed the greatest female athlete of the 20th century by Sports Illustrated. Her athletic accomplishments, literally second to none. She earned six Olympic medals, including three golds, and four world champion titles over the course of four consecutive Olympic Games. And just to give you an idea, that's 16 years of excellence. She holds, still holds the world heptathlon record. And in addition to the heptathlon, she competed individually at the 100 distance, 200, and the long jump. She also competed in basketball at the collegiate and professional levels. Less well known but equally impressive are her tireless efforts and remarkable accomplishments off the field as a philanthropist and as an advocate for racial equity, social reform, and women's rights. Now to put this in context, this athletic uh, ability of hers, uh, some of you may know that I have also competed in track and field and still participate at the master's level. In fact, over my career, I've, which began in college, I've also competed in the 100 and 200 and the long jump. So I really have a special appreciation for the times, her personal best times that she set in each of those events, times that I will have never approached and will never approach. <laughs> but what I'm really completely blown away by is her performance in the heptathlon. For those who may be unaware, the heptathlon is a series of seven events contested over two days. As I said, I've been in track and field for a while. And at some point in my life, I've actually competed in four of those seven events, the 100 and the long jump. The 800, which is actually the absolutely most embarrassing performance I've ever had in track and field, and the high jump, although the use of the word high would not describe my effort in that event. The other three events in that series are the shot put, which means you're throwing a nine pound ball as far as you can. The 100 meter hurdles, which violates my very premise of either run fast, jump high, but don't do both in the same event. <laughs> and the um, javelin. And I can tell you that it, had they allowed me to participate in that event, they would have likely had to clear the venue for the safety of all those that might have been watching the, uh, my, my effort. I'm pretty confident that I probably could have completed a heptathlon as well. However, it would likely have taken me seven days. And remember, she did this in two and set a world record that still stands 34 years later. Greatest female athlete. <laughs> Greatest female athlete. Check. So let's get back to today's event. The title of today's talk is from the opinion piece Jackie published on CNN, where she said, and I quote, we live in a world where sports have the potential to bridge the gap between racism, sexism, and discrimination. Today's panel aims to explore this insightful and somewhat radical statement. So we'll begin by hearing from Jackie herself, and then we'll invite Provost Phillips, as well as faculty from the Sports and Wellness and Diversity Initiatives to this uh, stage. After the discussion, there'll be time for a few questions from the audience, and then you're invited to stick around after the panel for cupcakes and coffee in honor of Jackie's birthday tomorrow. <laughs> I'll end by thanking uh, the Office of the President, Michael Show, for supporting this event today, and without further ado, Please welcome Jackie Joyna Kersey. Thank you. <laughs> it's an honor for me to be here and to be able to share my own experiences and and the path that I have been able to take in trying to really not knowing at the time that you were making change or have impact because back in the day, I can say, <laughs> you know, uh, we 1980s and 90s and dealing with some of the, the students and that weren't even born, you know, when you were talking about heptathlon or long jump or high jump or shot put, are the accomplishments. 
what I can honestly say is how sports put me in the room where I could have conversations that were very uncomfortable, deal with issues that most people didn't want to deal with, but more importantly, how could we make change? Because when I was coming up, uh, I never forget, I was, me and a teammate was on the track and the conversation was around women's pay. And for track and field, you know, we would get appearance fees, we would make money, and we were making pretty good money. But the gentleman at the time, he was a top athlete, and was like, y'all never make more money than us. And me and my teammate looked at each other, Gail Deaver, and we were like, we're already making more money than you. But we didn't say anything, it was just the harshness of it and the conversation. Like, we didn't deserve to have more, even though we're running the same distance. And so, throughout our journey of just trying to make sure that our voices was heard, even when they go into the rooms and be negotiating, and, and I know there were times when the negotiation came down to who they felt was superior, <laughs> And, and I would tell my husband, I don't care what they say. You know, they want to put me first in the long jump because this other jumper, you know, that's how they play these mind games, thinking that, oh, I guess I'm going to fall apart. I said, I don't care where they put me. How much are they going to pay me? Make sure they pay me the same as they paying this other person. So when I look at some of the societal changes and some of the, the challenges, that we're faced with and how can we go about trying to make some of the changes is that first of all we have to be at the table being at the table to even have those conversations and being able to share some of the things that we might not really want to share so in the 80s the women who came before me didn't have those same opportunities you know and we're living in a time of today where yeah, everybody's talking about diversity and inclusion and all these opportunities and, well, we don't want those opportunities to go by the wayside. You know, we need to have like-minded people with different ideas, but then in the end, how can we pull it all together and we'll see some real fundamental changes. You know, having people in decision-making positions. And it's not to take anything away from anyone because I was very fortunate that I worked with a lot of male coaches. And a lot of those male coaches were voices for the women who could not speak up for themselves. That made it possible for them to be in positions where they too can become a head coach. Or that male coach at one time was an assistant coach that was led by a female coach. You know, Robert Johnson, I know very well. He was at UCLA. He was an assistant. He comes to Oregon and win national titles. But given that opportunity, because people were in that position that made it possible. And that's the same way it needs to be across the board on all levels, is that people are in positions. How can you help put someone in a position to make those changes? So that quote I had about, um, racism, discrimination, sexism, because I really do think that sports can bring us together. Sports really unite us. We compete against people from all over the world and a lot of us speak all different kind of languages. But in the end, we find a way to work together. We might agree to disagree, but we find a way. And that's how I see sports in the world that I'm in from my own experiences. Yes, I dealt with racism. I dealt with discrimination. Dealt with sexism, gamingship. But I never lost, lost sight of who I am and what I wanted to do to put myself in a position to focus on the things I could control and not let the things I could not take away my energy 
that I would lose focus on making sure that the goals that I had set for myself to see fundamental change happen. And change is extremely hard and difficult. And most people say they want change, but they really don't. As I was speaking to some students earlier, and, and it was really an eye-opener to be able to see a visual of something far away, but then to be in the midst and to feel the pain that it was real, real painful because our students are really dealing with, just not students, but young people and families and everyone, we all had to pivot and change in 2020. Some of the students that are student athletes, so you imagine on the collegiate level that miss opportunities, but have an opportunity to be able to have a year given or an extra year. But those young students that's at the middle school level or junior high school level or the elementary school level that lost two years, they're never able to get an extra year. And also, those who are competing, especially with the young girls, is that they might have ran track in middle school, they lost two years, and now they're transitioning into high school. And they're like, oh, I don't do that anymore. And so it's trying to find a way to re-engage and uh, keep them you know, in the sport. But just getting back to how do we bridge that gap? How can we use sports for good? And that's what I have always tried to do with my life, is to use sports for good. And the statement I was going to make about the students in the class today at the Cultural Center was that it plays on their mental health. And we've seen the suicide rates go up and up and up. It's given them a safe place to be able to come and talk, to be able to release some of the things that they're dealing with even if something has been designated for African-American students and their white counterparts don't appreciate that and they find a way to destroy it. That's hurtful on so many levels when you're talking about trying to make change and having these comfortable and uncomfortable conversations. So for me, I saw what I grew up with that's why I built a community center, so I can bring people to the table. So we can empower our community to be the best and being able to pour into the young people we are trying to impact and hopefully grow and evolve and become some of the best human beings that the world would see. So I know we're gonna have a dialogue. I'll just give you a brief sum summation some of the things that I had experienced, some of the challenges along the way, but we can keep the dialogue going and we're opening it up, you know, for us to have the panel and have a, you know, a real healthy and engaging conversation. Thank you. Patrick Phillips, I'm the Provost and Senior Vice President of the University. I invite our other panelists to come up and while they're getting settled in, I'll just say a, a couple of words. First, I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Joyner Kersey for joining us today. Uh, what an honor for us. Um, you know, when I uh, talk to the School of Music and Dance, I like to talk about the fact that I, I learned to play sack butt in, um, in college because that has some uh, cachet, and now you can all Google what that means. Um, <laughs> but here, I like to say that I worked on the 1984 Olympics. Um, and I'm from Los Angeles originally, and I, I had a chance to work that during that summer. And I just have to tell you that uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey was a star of that, and, um, uh, and she's just such an icon for, uh, for everything. So uh, Vice President Marbury talked about uh, all of her things that she's brought to the field. Um, and we can use terms like 
uh, you know, greatest woman athlete. We would say one of the greatest athletes uh, that we've ever had in this country. I think at this moment in time, we know what's going on in the world today. We know that uh, the separation from politics um, and sport is also one of the issues. We're going to talk about uh, race and sport and other things. Um, but uh, in 1984, it was a moment where the way that she carried herself the, just uh, as a representative of the United States made her one of the greatest Americans that we've ever had as well. And so I'm just very proud that we can be here. So uh, I'm very happy that the panelists can be here. I want to take uh, a moment to acknowledge um, that conversations like this are exactly what a university needs to do, but it's also a big part of why uh, I helped create a couple of initiatives on campus. And this, this uh, program is supported in part by um, the diversity and sport and wellness initiatives that we have gotten underway. And the diversity initiative is uh, working to create an inclusive, equitable, and diverse institution, and especially to elevate scholarship of uh, folks who work in, in that area. And the objective of the Sport and Wellness Initiative is to center uh, uh, the strengths of the university, but always also in the context of equity inclusion. So the, when we get the initiative groups together, they're always talking about points of intersection. And this is the best possible exemplar of what that can look like. So for instance, uh, we're in this, this uh, sport and wellness, we're working on groundbreaking uh, product design that uses 3D body scanning um, and computer-aided design, physiology, and biomechanics to increase performance and make sport uh, more accessible to everyone, regardless of their uh, abilities. Um, and then through this uh, WUSAI Human Performance Alliance, we are uh, looking at effects of understudied issues uh, relevant especially to female athletes like bone stress fractures, predicting uh, connective tissue injury, targeting oxygen delivery, and uh, through their, the work of the initiative with UNESCO, we should um, really be working on a way to remove ever more the barriers um, uh, to society for all uh, individuals to participate in sport. So, my job is just to help facilitate a conversation, and I want to introduce uh, our, our panelists that have joined us now. So our first panelist is Dr. Courtney Cox. Uh, she's an uh, assistant professor in Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies Department, and her research examines issues related to identity, globalization, and labor within sport, and we'll hear more from her in just a moment. And she is joined by um, Savannah Segrist, who's a graduate student pursuing her MBA in sports business, one of the highlights of the university, and Savannah is a member of the UO Beach Volleyball team and co-president of the Women of Oregon. And if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to remove your mask at the, at the table. We have uh, appropriate distance given the current health circumstances, and I'm sure people would love to see your faces. So, uh, Dr. Cox, if I can believe, begin with you, just by way of introduction, yeah. um, we, It'd be great to hear uh, more about your uh, research and especially about your book. Ooh, ooh, book. Um, is this on? Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, so I, um, I come from a communication and journalism background. Before I entered academia, I worked for ESPN and Longhorn Network. Um, and one of the ways that I think about my work, again, labor, identity, and technology through sport, um, is thinking about, um, especially in this moment, um, I'm, I'm finishing a book focused on women's basketball around the world. Um, and it's a really interesting moment in 2022 as we come up on the 50th anniversary of Title IX. Um, I'm so wary, I'm so excited and wary um, about our kind of seduction for nostalgia um, of this like, look how far we've made it or we've made it, right? Even more terrifying, right? Um, and so for me in, in finishing this book this year, um, it's been really, um, fascinating. Even this week, it's been a week for women's basketball um, at the college and the pro level. And um, my work also thinks about um, global flows of labor. So I've been um, doing a lot of work and following a lot of athletes that are in Russia right now, a lot of U.S. athletes, um, especially women's basketball players that supplement their WNBA income by playing overseas. And so one of my chapters in my book um, actually goes overseas to Russia with a basketball player. And so I think a lot about um, black women and non-binary athletes and how they maneuver in this larger sports media complex. So that's the book. 
Um, but my hesitation with, with thinking about uh, the anniversaries, the fives and zeros that we, we love to talk about, is the work that's still yet to be done and how, in many ways, this anniversary will be weaponized in a lot of different ways. And so I'm so grateful to have this space and time to talk to both of you um, to think about and think together about the work that's left to be done. You talked about seats at the table, right? And you're obviously doing that work, board of directors, USATF. I think it's so important that current and former athletes are at the table, um, especially women, especially athletes of color, um, because decisions are being made by someone, right? We look at who's at the IOC. 10% of the IOC executive board are royalty, right? Um, so thinking about who makes the decisions for athletes, we think about the NCAA, um, who's at the top of those spaces, who makes those decisions. Um, it's not surprising when we look at the disparities in gender <laughs> last year uh, with March Madness, for example, the use of the term March Madness. And so for me, I've been thinking about every panel that I'm on this year, thinking about the work that's left to be done, whether we're thinking about um, racial and gender disparities or we're thinking about coaching disparities, um, the, the unintended harms of Title IX that have happened um, from youth sports all the way up to the pros. And so. I'm excited to have this conversation with both of you for that reason. Um, I'll leave it there because I obviously have lots of feels uh, about all of this. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Cox. So, Savannah, I, I wonder if you can tell us about uh, Women of Oregon, Be Oregon, and Be United, and uh, especially, you know, how you're applying what you've learned as a student athlete and how that combines with your actually academic work and uh, sports business as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a little far away from yeah, if, um, if uh, all the panelists could bring their microphones ever closer to their mouth, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, thanks. So to start off, just a summary of what I do and what we do as student athletes for our various uh, student athlete advisory committee. So I sit on Women of Oregon. We are the panel that we work to empower, educate, and also connect student athletes. So every day and every week, we just try to create events that bring together student athletes and female student athletes and make sure their voice is heard at the table. Um, Be Oregon is our diversity, um, equity, and inclusion initiative. So it's not only for race, it's also for LGBTQ, um, LGBTQ nationality, ethnicity, everything that comes into everyone, everyone's identity. Um, and then Be United is specifically for the black student athletes at University of Oregon. And so they work to create a space where they can feel heard and that they're, once again, seats at the table. Um, all these come together to create a, every space in a place of conversation for student athletes. Um, as a student athlete and a female in the business world, I think being a student athlete has empowered me to make sure my voice is heard and to understand that my views and point of views are unique and they're also impactful. So just learning and as I grow and age up and actually enter the business world in these coming years, I will just know that what I have to say and the point of views and all this growth that I've made throughout my life in sports is going to make the change and make sure that I'm at those seats at the table. Great, thanks so much. Well, what a uh, terrific and powerful uh, panel we have. And so, and as, uh, as Jackie said, we need to have hard conversations. So let's, let's do it. Um, let's get right to it. So I, I'd like to open a question that I think is of the essence of what we want to talk about today and to hear from each of you on it is, and I think everybody's already spoken to this, that sport is often seen as a platform for addressing societal issues, for creating change, for giving uh, folks a, a voice for uh, uh, advocating for that. So just this week, we had the US Women's National Team reach an agreement with US Soccer Federation in their dispute over equal pay. And uh, it seems from my external view, there are differences uh, of, of what that has meant. But um, how have you seen uh, the progression of sports in terms of their impact on society and uh, being at the forefront of these conversations. And Jackie, I wonder if I could start with you um, and your perspective over this time period. Seeing that progression? Yeah, and how, how have you seen that, uh, the, especially from an athlete's point of view, what, what is the voice and how is that heard? Um, when I look back at my own experiences, uh, 
Well, I try not to look at my own experiences. I really look from the perspective of the women who came before me, who uh, really were able to set uh, the tone without knowing that tone was being set. And so when you talk about the progression, is that yes, last week that was uh, not what they wanted, but uh, at least they was able to come up with an agreement that they were being heard and, and, and being seen. But I, I, for me, I take it a step further to the point where I think it starts with uh, the companies, you know, the people that are investing, you know, are investing in uh, women's sports or, or youth programs or that really money, you might not like it, makes the decisions. And that, but with money and with those decisions, we have the power because we are the buying. We're buying. And so when we start talking about uh, the change and, and, and the, the progress, and uh, it, it took a real, real unfortunate event to wake up a nation and that you talk about diversity and inclusion that uh, as, a, as a black person, you know, <laughs> I live in this world, you know, and, and when I look at women's sports is that we've been doing it for a long time and how can you measure, it? it's hard to measure when 1972, you know, we talk about celebrating 50 years of Title IX, but just the challenges of Billie Jean King during that time, you know, or, you know, Wilma Rudolph is someone who I truly admire, you know, and, and the Beja Harriet's before four days, or I'm fortunate, rest in peace, you know, the loss of Lucy Harris, you know, just, we don't, so, yes, it's, I, I see progress, I love where our, uh, our young people are today, but it's, it is a journey, you know, uh, a journey of hope that change will come, but it's, it's, it's gonna be a journey. It, it's just not, okay, yeah, they really trying to change Tiger Nine now. Mm -hmm. So we can't let that happen. So still, it's, it's an ongoing fight. And I, I'm grateful for uh, progress, but progress is relative when you're speaking. So Savannah, I wonder, as an athlete at uh, beginning her career, do do athletes feel a responsibility um, in this space? Uh, obviously, you're a leader in, in in that. What what are athletes of your generation thinking about in terms of interaction with society? I think the responsibility is definitely there. The the ability for us, and I think it comes back to voice again, and just to look at it through a different lens. And so when we have conversations, whether that's in class or that's in other, in our student athlete advisory committee, whether that's in student athlete leadership team for PAC-12, um, it's about understanding that a lot of people look at it from how far we've come. And I think the importance in what both Jackie and Courtney have already brought up is that it's actually about where we have to go. So, having that critical lens and challenging the everyone around us, whether that is male or female views, pushing them to see that just because we're having these conversations isn't necessarily a step forward. That's actually just a recognition of the problem. It's not an improvement of the problem. And so progress for progress sake isn't going to change the world as it is it's only going to have us make us have conversations even if they are tough conversations so i think also the great the shout for like corporations and the power of money um and i think there is a, an inherent problem of the undervaluation of women's sports and so having those conversations and bringing up those facts every day about what it means to want to invest in women's sports and the power that companies can have in that but how often it are the value of women's sports tied to men's sports. So when you donate to a university, that goes into a general fund, unless, we, unless universities have programs like Women in Flight. 
um, for we just did a project on the gender equity report for NCAA basketball. And you could not individually um, buy into NCAA women's basketball. You had to buy in as sponsors to men's basketball. And there was this circular problem where the revenues and all of the money that was coming in from tournaments was only attributed to men's basketball. And so when that happens is that you can't put any power behind women's sport if you don't give them the credit that they're due. So Dr. Cox, this is, you already have spoken to some of the trajectory that we're on, but this is your scholarship. So uh, where do you think we're headed and what do we need to be doing? Yeah, I think part of it is that I think there's some accountability um, that I'd like to maybe take off of athletes because they have enough <laughs> going on. Um, and I think that's not only because I study sport, um, because I think about labor, uh, what kinds of labor are invisible. Like Savannah is doing so much labor in addition to being an athlete, right? Um, and not all that labor is acknowledged or compensated. And so part of my job, and I think it's a job for all of us at a university setting where we have so many athletes under precarious labor, I think part of our job is to support them. And, and that can be in the classroom. It can be outside of it. It can be mentorship, right? And so um, I think that there is a way that I don't want to evade responsibility because we are in such a hub, look around, we are in a hub, right? That NCAA report doesn't come out without the convictions and the Instagram account of Sedona Prince, who was here, right? And so thinking about their work is part of it, is that they're doing this work, but also trying to be in the tournament and make moves, right? And so I think about that dual labor that we're asking sometimes of athletes, um, and I also like to not only center their voices in my work, I do a lot of interviews and participant observation in my work, um, and so part of my job is to listen. Like, what do athletes need? We had that this morning at the breakfast of just like, what, what do black athletes on campus need? Um, and so part of that is not assuming what people need, not assuming what women need. Because um, a lot of people are trying to speak for um, and, and on behalf um, of the very folks that have those lived experiences. And so I'm always challenging myself and, and course correcting. Um, and I think it's, it's something that keeps me humble, keeps me honest when I think about all the incredible things and all the strides that have been made. Um, I'm so glad you brought up Lucy Harris because I uh, had this really um, tough moment when she passed. Um, and it's weird, you know, it's weird to mourn someone you've never met, um, but her, her legacy is so real and it's, it's unfortunate when people get their flowers after they pass. Um, and I think that's part of, part of where my tears, I think, came from. And so um, part of my, my thought, especially as on this year, we have this opportunity to recalibrate this underinvestment um, that you're both speaking to is really important. Part of that report is about the millions of dollars that the NCAA and other institutions leave on the table by undervaluing women's sports. Um, so thinking about women's sports as a charity function, this is a huge thing. Won't go into all the, the latest with the WNBA and travel. Um, wrote a whole chapter on that. But one of the things about it is thinking about this as this charity thing, this thing that isn't profitable, this thing that is second to men's, right? The way we other it. It's like this idea of March Madness not being able to be attached to the women's game, right? And so all these things that we're hearing about, US Women's yeah. National Team, is another one, right? And so thinking about all the time you spend fighting is time that you're not training, recovering, resting, right? So it's like all of that work. Whenever we talk about athletes in any of my classes, it's, there's ways that we put them on this hero status. But for a lot of them, they, they didn't want to have to be the ones. They didn't want to have to go to court. They didn't want to go to the court of arbitration for sport. Um, they really just wanted to be great at what they do. And so I think part of the challenge, I think, going forward, the next 50 years, right, is what all of our roles are, right, as fans, as athletes, um, as, as lovers of sport, right? Whether we're thinking about youth sports, whether our kids play sports, whether we're encouraging other young um, kids to get into sport, right? Thinking about what's lost. I, I hadn't even fully processed what that means based on what age you are of this complete generation that, that we lose to all of the great, so there's all the ills we can speak about sport for sure. But there's all these things that we get, whether we're playing recreationally or at the elite level. And so I think, you know, I, I love the idea of talking about equity, but so much of that is financial equity, right? Investments at all levels. And so when we stop thinking about this as this thing that we're donating to, this charity endeavor, rather than a very profitable thing that is making money despite that undervaluation, underinvestment, I think that we're moving towards something. I don't know what that something is, um, but I think it's a shift of, of a mindset of who belongs, um, who's normalized in a space, 
and who the space is for, which I think moves beyond like, you know, even these initiatives that are very well-meaning, right? Because, because of how money is so influenced into this larger space. Thanks, I think uh, each of you have touched on themes that I think are, just keep coming up again in all of these conversations, not about sport, but just about equity in society in general. And it's the battle fatigue of the, say, women having to carry the message about why equity for women is important. Um, and I do think, uh, I think all of you also spoke to accountability. In this case, there's direct financial accountability through the corporate structures and things like that. As an institution, we, we try and think about what accountability is and, and the roles that we have. Um, I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for uh, questions for other folks. Just very quickly, uh, because we are in, the, uh, as Dr. Cox pointed out, in this university setting right now, you each have different experiences with being in a university uh, and, and encountering, it, uh, encountering it. What should a university be doing at this moment? Um, maybe not just in terms of the business of sport, but in terms of the research that we do or how we facilitate dialogue. And I think if we could just go around in the same order again, Jackie, I don't know if you have a perspective. You give a lot of talks, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, what the university could be doing is, I, I think it's um, more of having uh, and this might uh, be the right word, but the right people at the table. Because sometimes the university make decisions that ha they don't have any input from the groups they're going to impact. And that would be very important if you could be more uh, inclusive, you're not, you know, <laughs> but more open to bringing those other ideas that maybe you never even thought about because it's going to impact uh, someone or, you know. I remember mean, just a short story when I was competing and at the time that the heptathlon, which is the seven event discipline, and the decathlon, you know, they will always have our events somewhere else. Like we weren't a part of the sport. Mm -hmm. But then when we became world record holders and brought recognition, then now we're part of the main event. <laughs> So from the beginning, it must be level and thought that uh, you're a part of it. So in, you know, and I, I think in those terms, so bringing those. Great. Savannah, you have a very different experience of the university. I think it's the idea that sports and females and what, what you put in is what you're going to get out. And so we talk about non-revenue sports and revenue sports, but really that is just a reflection of the resources that are put in. So the, from monetary resources, marketing resources, the research that's gone into making sure female athletes can perform at their highest level, um, to having resources that are specialized for female athletes. There's so many stories about uh, strength and conditioning, dietitians, um, athletic trainers not understanding how female athletes work and putting them in the same box or having the same standards on them as male student athletes. And so that doesn't allow them to reach their full potential because they are constrained or they're overexerted by the same or different standards. Um, and I think the idea of acting as an advocate for us. And so what Dr. Cox was talking about of student athletes not always having the ability or having the energy or the extra time to be advocates for themselves. And so that's working on behalf of them at the conference level, at the um, national level, at the international level, and just making sure that the rules that govern us also are by us and for us. Um, and so University of Oregon does a great job at that. Um, President Schill is on the NCAA um, Board of Governors, which is an amazing voice to have at that table. But just making sure that also student athletes' voices are represented there without them being overexerted at that level. Um, and then just always having those conversations, having those open forums and those open um, channels of communication from 
having a reporting source from Title IX to um, making sure that Be United and Be Oregon and Women of Oregon are always included in conversations where they could have a voice and they could have an impact. Great. Dr. Cox. Yeah, so for me, one of the, the things I'm thinking about, the University of Oregon has such an incredible opportunity. And one of the ones I think about is sport product design. I'm just thinking about this idea of this one size fits all. Um, my next project, I've been thinking a lot about advanced analytics in sport, whether we think about advanced statistics or wearable technology or gambling, um, daily fantasy. That's the juicy chapter. Um, but I, I'm really thinking about how so many of the technologies, right? If you're, your Apple Watch, your Strava, your Whoop Strap, these things are tested on college athletes first. Um, and I think a lot about consent. Um, who can say yes to these things that are me measuring so much of your biometric data, what servers they go to, right? So I'm thinking about that. Um, people probably don't care about my heart rate uh, or you know how much sleep I got last night, but they care way more about what athletes are doing. And so um, for me, I think a lot about that in terms of feeling safe, uh, whether it's like your data is safe, uh, you feel safe, secure, you have a voice to, to resist, to say, no, I don't want that, or that doesn't feel good to me. Um, and that goes for everything that athletes wear. So sport product design, incredible opportunity here. There are folks that are thinking about women, women's sports, don't know how many folks in here um, that wear women's active wear that just want pockets. You know, we just want pockets, right? So I'm just talking about, <laughs> did not know that was gonna be the <laughs> Good work, yeah. Um, you know, we have things to store. We run with our keys as well. Um, so I, I think about this idea of, of the cut of clothes that we wear, the ways we want to feel comfortable, whether we're a weekend warrior, we're running a 5K, or we're in the heptathlon at the Olympics, right? Um, we, have, we have different needs, but we still have needs. Um, and so one of the things I'm so inspired about is like the folks that are in sport business and sport product design here are going to be the next folks. Those are folks that are pushing up on Rich Paul and Phil Knight. These are the people. We have such a rich opportunity. And if we aren't allowing, you know, part of what these partnerships do even when they're locked in with sport business or journalism here, super rich tradition here, a track bureau here, how incredible is that for students? But if we aren't allowing space from the JQA um, over to these actual departments, for athletes to get involved, they aren't gonna be at the table. We want Savannah at the table. We want someone who has this lived experience. And so one of the incredible opportunities we have, especially under NIL, right? is to empower athletes to be at these tables, to make biz to leave and know how to put together a pitch deck, to leave and know how to do, we want them to be able, we want them to be the Spencer Pacingers, right? That we celebrate in this space as U of O alum that can go into rooms and pitch things and be in these spaces. Are we empowering them to be something besides athletes? Um, are we asking them what they want, where they want to be a part of it? And that, that does everything from course schedule and structure um, to think about advocates. There's incredible faculty athletic representative here that helps navigate these spaces for athletes. And the FAR position is a very slept on position, um, but I think at the University of Oregon, I've seen it elevated and really um, emphasized in a way that feels good to me. Um, so I think in this moment where there are so many shifts happening in sport, um, the U of O has the opportunity to be the leader, like because of all these already established things that have all these rich faculty involved, all these communities and networks, are we using athletes to test things on them, right? Or are we giving them the ability to be creators in the space, right? I wanna see athletes do the physics. I wanna see athletes in the spaces that are creating these technologies, that are speaking on behalf, that are talking about the limits, the constraints, the concerns, right? Um, and so I can't think of a better place to set the tone than this space that's so highly visible. Uh, there's like this world's championship happening this summer, right? <laughs> there are these events, right? Um, this is the space, right? And I think that, especially when I think about athletics, when I think about track and field as this vibrant international space and all the ways that equity can happen specifically within that sport, there is so much untapped potential. Um, and so I'm really coming to this space and coming to this university, I've been so impressed um, and I've learned so much from the athletes here. And so I encourage all of you um, to listen to them. They have so much to say. They have so much to give. Um, I'll say one other quick thing, and then I'll definitely wrap. But uh, in grad school, I, was, um, I tutored student athletes. Um, and I learned more about how to be a good faculty member to all students um, just by being in that space. And so some of the things I found, and one of the examples, very tangible one I can give for how we can be better advocates of athletes on campus there um, was a professor that notoriously would not allow students to eat in class. This is pre-pandemic, y'all, so let's just put that out there. 
Um, and one of the things, you know, I, I heard the students say, you know, I came straight from lifting, went straight to this class, hadn't eaten anything. All I have the time to do is just grab stuff really quick, get there, and then, then I'm told I can't eat, right? And then I have practice after that, and then I have tutoring after that, and then I have film study out, you know? So they have this crammed day, and you know, you're running a class to get there on time, only to be told like, why are you eating, right? You can't eat here. And so you're singled out in a particular way. And I went and talked to this professor, because the student was like, I'm trying to do well in this class, I feel like this professor doesn't like me, they don't understand. And so I went and talked to the professor, and I explained the schedule, I was like, this person just came from Lyft. They literally have nothing on their body. Um, and this isn't disrespectful to your course, um, but you have to also understand and meet students where they are, right? Um, and so one of the things, I mean, again, I hope that no other athlete or anyone else that has any other need to eat in class, there's a variety of reasons someone might need to eat in class, um, had that issue. And so part of it is understanding where students are coming from, not assuming disrespect, People can be disrespectful. But thinking about like what is happening, right? And so, so much of what I learned, I learned way more from the tutoring thing, I, I should say, that I hope they learned something too. But um, I think one of the things I learned is how, how to better teach, how to meet people where they are, um, and understanding the very unique um, experience um, of being an athlete on a, on a campus, especially if we're talking about D1, it comes with the specific pressures. And so, um, for me, I think there's lessons we can all learn by listening. This is a super small example, but thinking about the ways that folks are either ostracized or read as disrespectful or not, not into the class or not invested, um, understanding all the different things that, that may come with that. Great, thanks. That was a great advertisement for the Sport and Wellness Initiative, I have to say as well, so I appreciate uh, that. But also another part of what I think a university, and this University of Oregon needs to do ever more, is also uh, uh, provide our convening function, that is to help these conversations provide platforms for them regardless of what we're doing as faculty or students. And so, um, especially women in sport is something that we'll be continuing to focus on uh, from here on out as far as I can see because I think we have a unique opportunity as an institution to do that. With that in mind, we have just a little bit of time for a couple of questions. I think there's two microphones if people uh, have any questions they'd like to uh, approach the microphone and ask the panelist. Don't be shy. Here comes some random person. <laughs> Why don't you uh, give us your name first? <laughs> I'm uh, Robert Johnson, and I coach track and field here at the University of Oregon. <laughs> Vice President Phillips. So, uh, nice of you guys to do, to do this. Jackie uh, mentioned uh, me earlier, so I felt compelled to come up here and uh, share and cause controversy and ask some hard questions to you guys. <laughs> A um, couple of stories first. Uh, I'm in the unique position to where I coach both men and women. So I see both sides of the fence here when it comes to the racism, the sexism, the differences in pay and sports, uh, because of course we have lots of kids that go on and be professionals here in track and field. And my time with Jackie there, uh, one of her, her husband was is one of my mentors, uh, as well as um, my former boss, uh, Jeanette Bolden. Um, there at UCLA was my, my boss there and has ran on the team with Jackie as well. And so she helped me uh, with coaching women uh, one day when uh, we were talking about PMS and women and I was going to give some athletes uh, some time off and some di days off from practice. And she told me, Robert, don't you dare do that. There are no women, there are no men, there are athletes out here and don't you hold them any less accountable uh, than anybody else that you would do for the men. Now, uh, I fast track that statement to today in the world that we live in, and this is 97, 98. For me to have that same mentality and for me to have that same thought process, I'd probably be roasted somewhere <laughs> here uh, at the university. Um, and so I asked the panel, is there a play? Because her point there is, this is another tool that separates us. It puts women in a box. Uh, it allows you to treat them less than. Uh, this PMS thing. And so we're athletes and you treat all of them and you hold all of them accountable the same, men as well as women. So my question to you guys is, what's right in 97 or in 2022 that we are? Do the athletes want to go first? Or? <laughs> I recommend the provost does not answer this question. <laughs> Jackie, are you willing to wade into this? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I am a firm believer <laughs> that there is no separation. <laughs> They're athletes, you know, and I am not going to minimize you or, and, and then that's just, that's just my belief. And I, I, I come from uh, uh, that school of, of thought. So when we would train, uh, we knew that uh, Wednesday was off day. Everybody got the same off day. But you show up, you're ready to go. And, but I know we're living in, in different times because the mentality now is totally different. But what worked for you, work for you. You know, and, and, I, I, and, I, and I do understand that, you know, uh, I don't tell you the truth. I don't, I don't understand why we, we make adjustments. Because I think once you start making adjustments, you make adjustments for the rest of your life. Because when you put out into the world to compete, you compete. When you go into a job interview, yes, maybe you have to change your name, which is unfortunate. You might not get it because your name is, sounds something differently or, you know, but you're in a, in a situation where you have to uh, perform your best. And, and so, I'm from the 80s and the 90s, so <laughs> I know we're living in, the, in 2000 now, because tomorrow I'm be 60 years of age, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, God willing, you know? <laughs> so, not, no. uh, <laughs> so, the panelists have a choice to uh, solicit another question or to answer if they want to weigh in, but I'm fine get, uh, getting another question. Oh. It, it, but if you feel like you want to speak to oh, it, I'm please go. I'm trying to help you. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate this question. Let me start there. Because um, I, I love the place that you're coming from. Like, you're coming from a, a place of trying to understand. I just want to have conversations like this. So first of all, I just appreciate that. I appreciate you for that. So my thought, now, uh, one of the things, uh, I, I have the opportunity to work with an incredible coach here um, at U of O that's also a biomechanics PhD. Um, and I've learned so much from her. And, uh, and one of the things I think that I have learned um, is how, how, and with coaching, there's all these different ways you have to coach differently. So I unfortunately had my dad as a coach for a brief, very brief period of time. It did not go well. Because um, my dad has one style, and it, we just, we didn't, we weren't compatible, right? Um, and I've had so many different coaches that, you know, I've had the good coach, bad coach strategy, which is like my best one, like the, the tough love coach, and then the coach is like, you got this. Like, I kind of, I kind of need both. And everyone needs something different. I've realized some people need the coach that is like on them. They need someone to be on them. And some people need someone that is just the support, right? I need some kind of mixture. And in the same way, so many of us are different in, in terms of not only our own leadership styles or what we need from leadership. I'm not trying to get away from this question. One of the things I think is about this individualized, regardless of gender, we all need something a little different, right? And it is true, when we go out in the world, PMS is happening, but also so is the work, right? Um, and so there is something about what, what the world will ask of us. But I think there's something that all athletes are needing things differently, um, emotionally, physically, um, in many different ways. Mentally, like how mental health support works, it's not one size fits all. Right. So for me saying like, well, all the women need this and all the men need this, don't help us move forward. Because it is so many things within genders um, there's so much variation there, too, of what people need. And so my answer is I don't think either one are, are right or wrong, right? I live in this gray space in general. But I think there's something about this individualized experience. And one of the things I've learned um, from Coach O especially is, like, this idea of learning your athletes. And one of the things that I, I think has been great in learning from her is how she's like, sometimes I know someone's got it. I can tell from that day when I see them come out on the track, this is their day, or oof, so they don't really got it. I'm gonna need to do this. And it's this adaptable experience, even within one athlete, of like, this person, this person might need a little extra this, whatever the this is, right? Or like, as soon you don't even need to see the jump. You already are like, they got this today, regardless. This is a record day, you can feel it. And it's a mixture of, of practice, repetition, knowledge, and all that's fused into this thing, right? So some people think it's improvisation or you have this tingle, right? But it's really a learned, it's a form of, of really high intelligence and knowing sport. And one of the things I think I'm so impressed about with fantastic coaches, 
obviously have one here, um, is their ability to adapt to what their athletes need in the moment. And so for me, there's no one size fits all approach, right? I would not, if I were a coach, which not putting myself in that position, um, but I, I think in the same with my students, I do the same thing, right? There's no like, everyone needs this. It's this idea of like meeting people where they are. And so I, I would be very discouraged to do that as well, just because that, that doesn't contain all the multitudes of what being a woman that's an athlete is. Um, and so I would really, I'd really push back on that um, and think about like the, I, I don't want to kind of do this biological determinism that's happening here by saying they all need this day, they all need some days off or whatever. Um, I, I don't think that helps us move forward. Savannah, I'm going to give you the opportunity to have the last word if you're interested. Um, yeah, I think the I think the theme for today was women will do in spite of. Mm -hmm. So in spite of the resources they are given, in spite of the you know the whatever day of the week it is, like women will find a way. And so for female athletes, like you can like something I ask my teammates all the time is like, okay, what if today was a competition? What if today was a match? Mm. So if you if you feel like you could play today, you can practice today. You can push through. You can do that. And if it's not the case, then today's not your day, and then you got to take it easy, or you have to you have to take the day off. But so it's just I love the meeting athletes where they are, meeting people where they are. It's so important. It's such an important conversation. And then meet them where they are, and then challenge them to move forward. So it's not going to be like let them be where they are all the time. It's about letting them out of their comfort zone and giving them opportunities to grow and thrive. Can I add one thing? Yes, too? please, I, of I, course. I, I think it's also very important that uh, we keep in mind that you hire people for a certain reason. So even with coaches, we really have to allow them to coach. And athletes have to remain coachable, you know, and and that's why they're there, because they will identify, you know, what this person might need, what that person might need, you know. <laughs> you know, because I, I, I think that's very important. <laughs> Great. Well, when you get a standing O, it's time to... Uh, no? Yeah, one. Uh, so... Uh, I, it's uh, impossible to believe, but we're actually at the end of our time, and we could obviously go on. And I apologize to the audience who wanted to ask more questions, but uh, I'm standing between you and cake, and uh, that's never wise. So uh, I, w I first want to thank all of the members of the panel, and there it comes. Uh, well, I'm going to deliver it, apparently. So, um, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, everybody who participated. This has been a great conversation. Obviously, uh, you brought goodwill, humor, and uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, just in uh, briefly, uh, I hope that this just becomes again and again something to do. And, and for uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey, for you to come and, and share uh, your time with us is invaluable, especially on your birthday. So here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to do something that is not on the script. We're actually going to sing happy birthday. Ah. Are you ready? And I'm going to move this away from my mouth. Uh, ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jackie. Happy birthday to you. Thank you all.